Hey everybody, this is Matt, Janelle, Sophia, and Shane. Welcome to our presentation on the Joint Commission and its relevance to nursing practice. I'm sure we've all heard about this organization at some point during our clinical rotations or reading through our textbook. And hopefully this PowerPoint will help you all gain some valuable information that will be relevant for all of us as we transition and begin practicing independently in the near future. So we're going to start off by talking a little bit about what the Joint Commission is in the first place. Well, the Joint Commission on the Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations is a global nonprofit organization that provides accreditation to medical services on a global scale. The organization is focused on establish, establishing and improving various patient safety and healthcare standards to support performance improvement within healthcare organizations. The Joint Commission is the most commonly utilized source of hospital accreditation in the U.S. and assists facilities in meeting various federal regulations and public safety guidelines. So now we're going to talk a bit about the brief history of the Joint Commission that I have here. So when it comes to the Joint Commission, although the organization wasn't founded until 1951, there were various regulating bodies that oversaw healthcare functions. So in the early 1900s, the standards enforced by these institutions could typically be fit on just several pages, which you can imagine is not the most detailed set of guidelines to follow. So when the Joint Commission was formed, it combined the American College of Physicians, the American Medical Association, the Canadian Medical Association, as well as the American Hospital Association to create a more universal standard of practice with far less variability in standards. The Joint Commission is now the largest and oldest accreditor in the U.S. So we're going to talk a little bit about what accreditation is in the first place now. So a large number of facilities across numerous healthcare settings seek to become accredited by the Joint Commission. But how does the process work in the first place? Well, accreditation is based around preset evidence-based standards and patient safety goals that the facility and employees need to abide by to retain or gain this status in the first place. Both violations and a risk analysis are documented and provided to the facility upon a survey. And if their standards aren't met, a period of time is given to modify these policies and procedures to reattempt the survey at a later date. Passing the organization's extensive inspection is intended to reflect a commitment to patient safety and quality of care. There are also various certifications that can be earned to indicate an area of particular excellence along the patient continuum of care in a facility. These are much more specific to help emphasize a particular area of the facility for its consumers. These may include advanced stroke certifications, certifications in prenatal care, in hospital organizational functions such as healthcare staffing. There are plenty to go through. An exhaustive list can be found on their website though if any of you are interested. So many people fear the JCO survey, not typically because of what the outcome can be, but rather of the unknowns that come along with it. So once ready, a facility being surveyed will indicate a month in which the survey itself will take place. And then sometime during that month at a randomized time, a team of joint commission surveyors will come in and typically survey various areas of the hospital and talk to various members of the healthcare team to trace a patient's experience within the organization. Patients are selected at random and their online medical records are used to guide the investigation of standardized compliance. Accreditation standards do change fairly frequently though, so it's important for the facility to monitor these changes on a continual basis. Accreditation status is awarded for three years at a time with an on-site survey required every 18 months to maintain this status. The quality reports from the Joint Commission about certain facilities are public on their website.
So the established standards and patient safety goals set forward by the Joint Commission are based on problems identified through newly found data, indicating evidence-based practice and collaboration with various advisory panels, focus groups, experts, and other stakeholders involved with healthcare logistics. The standard itself set out by the Joint Commission is the result which hospitals must achieve while the goals are measurable outcomes provided to a facility to reach the standard itself. Additional standards are added only if there is sufficient evidence to indicate that their achievement will bring about higher patient safety or quality of care and also have a positive impact on healthcare outcomes in an accurate and measurable way. These modifications can be applied to aspects of patient care or other organizational functions. Separate standards and safety goals are created and applied to the eight main settings individually. Both standards and patient safety goals are subject to ongoing feedback and continuous modification if need be and are updated quarterly. So at the end of the day, after all the hassle that comes with maintaining or getting Joint Commission accredited, how does the facility benefit? Well, although the Joint Commission survey and accreditation status can be stressful at times to maintain, for those working in the facility, there are certain benefits that it brings with it. First and probably most importantly, becoming accredited allows federal funding to be provided as well as other government and state mandated regulatory requirements to be met. Additionally, insurance coverage costs can be improved through more effective risk management that is brought on by the attainment of the Joint Commission's goals. Working towards improving and organizing high quality services assists the facility compete in a very competitive market by attracting new patients who are drawn to the commitment to developing excellent patient care as well as those that the facility already serves. It can also assist in the recruitment of high quality staff members who are also drawn to this high commitment to quality patient care. Okay, so why is accreditation important? Well, according to the Joint Commission, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services requires hospitals to be accredited to receive Medicare reimbursement. And this is not necessarily just Joint Commission accreditation, but other accrediting bodies also count towards this. Um, JCO standards and inspections help improve safety outcomes. JCO accreditation can also help attract more qualified employees that would prefer to work for an accredited hospital. And JCO accreditation helps hospitals in some states fulfill their regulatory requirements. This means that further state inspection may not be required if a hospital is JCO accredited. All right, let's take a look at how accreditation improves patient outcomes. So it increases evidence-based practice. We'll take a look at heart patients as an example. And accreditation in general also improves patient outcomes. So in an article by Ja on the JAMA forum, he reported that evidence suggests that hospitals that are accredited tend to adhere more towards evidence-based practice. For example, one study that he found talks about how patients with heart failure treated at accredited hospitals were more likely than those at non-accredited hospitals to receive ACE inhibitors, and patients with an acute MI were more likely to receive aspirin upon arrival to these accredited hospitals. Um, however, in the end, he looked at Joint Commission hospitals versus other accrediting bodies and found that on average, there was really no difference between the mortality rate or the readmission rate. So is accreditation worth it? The Joint Commission inspections happen once every 36 months for a hospital. And oftentimes this can be a pretty stressful time for employees since JCO comes unannounced. So the big question, is all of this worth it? Well, besides the positive patient outcomes associated with being accredited, let's take a look at the effect specifically on nurses. So a study in the Journal of Nursing Care Quality set out to study the effect of JCO on the nursing work environment. 
So the authors in this study developed a tool to evaluate nurses' perceptions on Draco. They found that for all the complexity of the accreditation process, nurses reported that it had generated a better working climate and improved interaction among different professions, departments, and units. Usually such changes evoke negative reactions from the staff, at least in the early stages of the process, but three months after the accreditation process has ended, the nurses provided positive responses. They reported that physician-nurse relations had improved, the involvement of other healthcare professions, such as social workers, dietitians, and physiotherapists had increased. The support services also responded more quickly to requests and relation between management and the line staff had become closer. The authors kind of conclude that maybe if they had asked their questions earlier in the accreditation process, the response would have been had more negative. So from this, we can conclude that, you know, the accreditation process being stressful in the immediate aftermath, it might be more negative uh, response from the nurses, but after it's been implemented, it's overall positive for the nurses and the rest of the hospital staff. So now let's take a look at a JCO spokesperson on the accreditation. Historically, hospitals had felt that uh, sharing their failures or their problems with the Joint Commission could potentially affect their accreditation. In fact, what the Joint Commission is dedicated, the work we're doing is to help organizations improve and improve in safety and improve in their performance improvement efforts. Uh, sharing with us uh, problems that they're having, challenges that they're having is helpful because we may have solutions and th these solutions are available uh, on their internet site as well. A recommendation for improvement is a finding that is uh, observed during the survey. And it's usually telling the organization that there is a process or a problem that can potentially be at risk, to, uh, present a risk to a patient. So if it's identified before someone is injured or a patient is harmed, that should be celebrated. It's a, an opportunity for the organization to improve its safety. Accreditation is only one of the things that an organization has to do to keep its patients safe. And if it's committed to that and committed to harming, uh, not harming patients or zero harm, then its efforts have to be every day, regardless of whether the survey is coming. The purpose and the end goal is for the patient, not for the survey. Okay, so this is a little graphic uh, we put together just to demonstrate how the overall patient safety goals that the Joint Commission issues are organized. You can see that there are multiple different categories and we're just gonna give a brief overview of each one. According to the Joint Commission's website, information is gathered annually from recognized experts and stakeholders about new and recurring safety issues that are occurring throughout these numerous healthcare settings. This information is used as the foundation for establishing goals specific to different healthcare settings. For example, goals related to increasing patient safety in hospital settings is able to be found under the Hospital 2021 National Patient Safety Goals Chapter. This is extremely beneficial for healthcare providers because it makes it easy for us to find patient safety goals that are relevant to our specific work environments. Um, as I said, we're not gonna go into much detail about all these different categories as it's pretty exhaustive, but we just wanted to give a brief overview of what each of these offers. The ambulatory healthcare category involves safety goals and standards for professionals in ambulatory care settings, such as physical rehabilitation centers. 
The critical access hospital category includes safety goals and standards for professionals in critical access hospitals. These facilities are designed to provide limited inpatient and outpatient hospital procedures in more rural communities. These goals are particularly important along with the hospital safety goals because nurses in critical access hospitals might be farther away from more advanced trauma centers, and thus they may have more individual responsibilities. The hospital category will be discussed later in this presentation, so we're going to skip that one for right now. The nursing care center category involves safety goals and standards for settings like skilled nursing facilities. This is where patients are considered residents since these settings are serving as their homes. The behavioral health care category includes safety goals and standards for professionals working in settings with patients who are struggling with mental health issues on either an inpatient or outpatient basis. As we know, safety is an especially important consideration within this sphere of nursing. So nurses working within these settings should always stay up to date on these safety goals and ways to protect and advocate for their patients. The home care category addresses goals and standards for professionals who provide home-based health care. This is another category where patient safety is especially critical and thus nurse, nurses acting independently in this field should pay attention to these goals. The laboratory category sets goals and standards for professionals working in labs where patient samples are often being handled. This category has the least amount of goals and is mostly focused on standard precautions such as using gloves when handling patient samples and washing hands frequently and between every sam sample. It also involves proper patient identification, making sure that the labs and the results go back to the person they're meant to. Lastly, the office-based surgery categories focus on goals and standards specific to outpatient surgery centers. These involve including these involve proper use of medications, infection prevention, and preventing medical error. So we're going to take a closer look at one at what one of these categories or um, sets of standards looks like. Since most of us are going to be starting a clinical rotation in a hospital setting, these goals are very important for us to be familiar with. According to the Joint Commission, the first goal listed under the hospital 2021 patient safety goals is to identify patients correctly. The Joint Commission states that correct patient identification is critical for patient safety, especially when it comes time to administer medications and drugs. Along with every goal, there is a standard that nurses can use to make sure that the goal is being met. The Joint Commission states that in the case of correct patient identification, the standard practice is to always use at least two ways to identify patients. An important thing to mention is that these practices apply to both entry-level and veteran nurses. Entry-level nurses may want to take extra care to review these goals frequently so they can familiarize themselves with it and incorporate it into their daily practice. Veteran nurses will want to be looking at these frequently as well, as we know evidence-based care and standards are continuously changing. The way they may have been doing things for years may not necessarily be best practice anymore. So it's really important to pay attention to. So we've discussed the purpose of the Joint Commission and their national patient safety standards. We have looked at accreditation requirements and know which specific goals are for the critical access hospital. Now we're going to look a bit more deeply at three goals that professional nurses can have an important impact on in the United States. Medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. More than 10% of medical errors are medication errors. Part of the Joint Commission Patient Safety Goals is to aid healthcare institutions and practitioners in their effort to limit grievous mistakes. The third goal is to improve the safety of using medications. Targets of this goal include before a procedure, medications that are unlabeled should be labeled, such as those in syringes, cups, and basins. 
extra care should be taken for patients on medications to thin their blood, and more attention should be paid in general about a patient's and their medications, both by healthcare workers and those ensuring patients know how to understand what they are taking. A 2020 article on medical error prevention published on Stop Pearls stated unequivocally that medication errors are considered a preventable event. They note common medication errors include overriding medication use safeguards, errors in gaining access to medication dispensers, failure to pay attention to the product label, and medication misuse associated with drugs healthcare related products, procedures, order and product labeling, packaging, monitoring, nomenclature, administration, compounding, dispensing, distribution and use. Recent research published on the Global Health, um, I'm sorry, Global Journal of Health Science in 2015 noted the top five causes of medication error according to nurses to be fatigue due to high workload, the large number of critically ill patients, doctors damaged and unreadable orders, the low ratio of nurses to patients, and environmental conditions that led to distraction, such as noise and heavy traffic, etc. As we can see, some of these causes of medication error are out of the nurse's control but the consequences will likely be borne by the nurse and their patient. For this reason, the three stipulations on improving the safety of medications according to the Joint Commission, National Patient Safety Goals as defined previously, will support the nurse in providing evidence-based care, especially when combined with the standard five rights of medication administration. The next goal we will discuss is the Joint Commission's 2021 National Patient Safety Goal number seven, which is to reduce the risk of healthcare associated infection. With the means for reaching this objective as compliance with CDC and or the World Health Organization hand hygiene guidelines. As noted in the CDC 2019 report on healthcare associated infections or HAIs, one out of every 31 hospital patients developed an HAI. Approximately 687,000 HAIs occurred in 2019 at acute care hospitals. And of those 72,000 patients died with HAIs during their hospitalization. In her 2015 article for Infection Control Today, Elizabeth Sarek notes that 80% of infectious disease are transmitted by touch, and only 40 to 50% of healthcare personnel observe proper hand hygiene. She further acknowledges that ongoing training for healthcare professionals should increase efficacy and compliance of hand hygiene protocols. These posters generated by the CDC are an important part of nurse teaching for patients and reminds everyone to observe hand hygiene after using the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, before eating, before and after caring for someone who is sick, after changing a diaper or helping a child use the toilet, after blowing your nose, coughing or sneezing, after touching an animal, animal feed or animal waste, and after touching garbage. It also shows the steps for proper hand washing. This is general public information that is often posted in healthcare institutions. The CDC recommends a combination of alcohol-based hand sanitizer and hand washing with soap and water to be performed throughout a healthcare worker's day. According to their guidelines, an alcohol-based hand sanitizer is appropriate immediately before touching a patient, before performing an aseptic task, such as placing an indwelling device or handling invasive medical devices, before moving from work on a soiled body site to a clean body site on the same patient, 
after touching a patient or the patient's immediate environment, after contact with blood, body fluids, or contaminated surfaces, and after, immediately after glove removal. Washing with soap and water is also appropriate in those situations just mentioned, and it is strictly indicated when hands are visibly soiled, after caring for a person with known or suspected infectious diarrhea, and after known or suspected exposure to spores such as C. difficile. Because this simple task can have such a great impact on patient health, and since a reminder never hurts, the following video from the World Health Organization shows proper hand washing technique. The final 2021 patient safety goal that we will look at in depth is number 15, which calls on the hospital to identify safety risks inherent in its patient population, and specifically states that goal is to reduce the risk for suicide. With the World Health Organization estimating that over 800,000 deaths occur by suicide each year, this is a clear public health crisis requiring attention. The Joint Commission recommends that psychiatric hospitals and units carry out environmental and patient risk assessment, that non-psychiatric units employ mitigation procedures for high-risk patients, and that all patients who are being treated or evaluated for behavioral health be screened for suicidal ideation. The Commission further recommends that an evidence-based process to conduct a suicide assessment of patients who have screened positive for suicidal ideation occur, but provides no stipulation of which process or assessment tool to utilize. There are many tools for assessing suicide risk that have been utilized over the years. Historically, the sad person scale and the updated mnemonic of is path warm have been used to determine immediate risk in a patient. More recently, the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality or CAMS model has been a template for assessment that requires specific training and administration by a psychiatrist. For healthcare providers not trained in this, the Beck Scale for Suicide Ideation and the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale are evidence-based, reputable, and appropriate options for screening patients considered at risk.
It is further noted by the Joint Commission that facilities should have written policies and procedures for counseling and follow-up care at discharge for patients identified at risk for suicide. These are just three examples of how Joint Commission goals provide guidance for healthcare workers in general and nurses in specific to practice evidence-based care that is constantly improving. In addition to the safety goals that the Joint Commission drafts every year, there are continually updating resources for healthcare professionals. As nurses are such a critical part of the healthcare system, they have an entire section on their website dedicated to free resources just for nurses. They provide educational material to nurses to help them better understand their role in patient safety. And this goes over topics like reliability, and places that the profession of nursing could seek to improve as a whole. They also have a portal to access different nursing blogs. This is where nurses can get together from all different parts of the country and talk about their individual practices, areas of nursing that they are passionate about, and how they utilize patient safety goals within their practice every day. The Joint Commission also posts information on issues within the nursing community, including workplace violence, infection prevention and control, suicide risk, and health equity. The Joint Commission is very open about the need for quality and educated nurses. To them, this also includes making sure that nurses have all the resources they need at their disposal to advocate for themselves and learn about ways to potentially solve issues within the healthcare community. There are specific blogs for each of these areas as well, where nurses can share their experiences and gain knowledge from one another. This has been our presentation on the Joint Commission and patient safety goals. Thank you all for watching.